Okay, so. okay well, uh, welcome everybody to our LPLS talk uh, tonight. My name is Eric Blair. I'm president of uh, Leeds Phil and Lates, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, what I think promises to be a most interesting talk. So um, I think uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Rachel Unsworth, our event secretary, who's going to chair uh, the meeting tonight. And uh, she's going to introduce Dan Hicks. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you. So Professor Hicks has been at Oxford's Pitt Rivers Museum since 2007, and he oversees world archaeology there. He spent a decade as a field archaeologist before becoming a student at Oxford University. His experience of being a postgraduate at Bristol and then doing his PhD fieldwork in the Caribbean drew him into debates about the history and legacy of empire. As a senior academic and an influential curator now, he's been active in unearthing and communicating the reality of how objects on display in our museums come to be there. And he plays a strong role in an international movement now seeking to change practices of display and ultimately to challenge the continued holding of cultural artifacts that arguably belong with the descendants of the people who made them. His recent book, British Museums, was published at a moment when the debate had become even more heated and high profile. And so the Leeds Phil and Lit, he's going to summarise the arguments and how his work is contributing to moving ideas forward. Um, I'm just going to stop. stop. OK, so I'm going to mute myself now. OK, wonderful. Thank you um, for, for that, that introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, so it's absolutely wonderful to be here. Um, I'm just going to put, I'm really talking about a book but also maybe, a, a, you know, around some of the events that have happened after the publication of the book in the November of, uh, of last year. So in the, uh, the chat, I'm just going to put a link to the book and, and also a code you can use for a discount uh, on it. And I'm also now going to share my screen, which hopefully everyone can now see. Um, and if I could also uh, also just ask everyone to make sure that they haven't got got, got their uh, volume on as well, because I, I think there's a little bit of some noise in the background there. So if you can make sure you are switched off, that would be great. Wonderful. OK, um, so, yeah, um, you know, I'm going to be talking about this for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and so really, this is a oops, sorry. Um, this is a um, book which is written really from a certain location. Um, and it's a location in which I'm sat sort of now. I mean, here are the historic displays of the, the, uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum. For those of you unable to uh, picture it, uh, it is a big Victorian railway station of a museum. And so I'm sorry, if it's okay, if you could just ensure that you're not turned on with, with your volume, please. That would be really helpful. Thanks. So it's a Victorian institution founded in 1884. And as we heard earlier, I've worked here for almost 14 years now. Um, and I think these institutions of anthropology and archaeology, which were founded at the height of empire, um, in a lot of ways, I mean, my role in this institution or those sort of like me who work in them our role in some ways sort of certainly is to keep things you know, the same to make sure that the fabrics aren't eaten by moths and that the metalwork isn't going to rust away but I guess the sort of sort of argument of the book starts with that sense that sometimes curators like me have experienced a sort of the emission creep they have started to misunderstand their, their role as seeking to stop sort of history from changing around our institution. So, so the book is really seeking to keep the, you know, to sort of reimagine sort of what, um, as, a, as, a sort of, as a sort of a public space, 
what anthropology museums are for, you know, in this moment of, of history in which we find ourselves. Um, so the organization of the museum is unusual and uh, Pitt Rivers, obviously it's a named museum and it's named after Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, who was uh, born actually really very near Leeds. Um, and his sort of, uh, his identity as a Yorkshireman, you know, has, a, has an influence upon uh, sort of his interest in archeology span to some degree, how he learned archeology, span uh, you know, you know, in excavations in uh, Yorkshire and out towards Hull, um, but also, you know, it's a named museum that sums up really a sort of theory which he built in the 1850s and 1860s. And here is the drawing that he made in order to, in order to try to show that theory, to summarise that theory, which in many ways is the it appears a drawing of the sort of evolution of the wooden stick. So in the middle of the diagram, there is, there's an imaginary wooden stick. And then as you can see, sort of you're moving out to the sides, our shields and our lances, our boomerangs and so on. So these are weapons, sort of all of which are objects which we can identify in the museum now. And so they're, they're actual objects, they're real objects, and they're all from a single society. They're all Australian Aboriginal objects. Um, and they are organized or sort of laid out according to a hypothetical, what he called a series. So he, he had no sense of the relative sort of age of each of these objects. These are things that with so much of things that he acquired, he simply sort of purchased in London from the dealers and, and the auction houses. So these are things which are uh, washing up from empire, but also to some degree, he's sort of taking them from the museums of the Royal Armouries and from the USI, the United Services Institute, Institute which is now uh, RUSI, the think tank, that had its own, uh, its own collection, you know, in the 1850s, 1860s. So he's he's sort of acquiring these objects and laying them out according to a theory that you can apply thinking about evolution from the natural world in, in, into the much more yeah, messy and complex world of objects. So this is a sort of a cultural evolution of things, which he's arguing. Which in some ways, I mean, I guess we can make two observations about this theory that has led to the Pitt Rivers continuing to this moment to be organized according to sort of type. It's a typological museum in that all of the boomerangs are in one case, all of the shields are in another case, you know, and that also applies to other sorts of objects other than the weaponry that was of interest to him initially, as a, indeed as a as a uh, soldier and as someone involved in the improvement of the rifle that was used by the British in the 1850s, that idea of sort of, of, sort of ongoing, very yeah, minor alterations in form leading to improvement and advantage over time was a theory that started in his interest in weapons, but ended up something he was interested in sort of more generally in terms of objects, in terms of what he called the arts of life, everyday objects. So his interest was not in collecting the unique and the one-off, it was exactly the opposite. He was interested in things that were, you know, representative, you know, of a certain object type and all the various ways in which sort of those object uh, types might be made. So I think the two things we can say about this, I mean, first off, obviously, it is a theory built on you know, militarism of some kind. Uh, it's a fairly sort of ordinary Victorian improvement narrative on the surface, but it does have this relationship to the ongoing improvement of sort of weaponry. And that sort of inherent relationship, that historic relationship with empire, 
and with uh, violence was something that really was underlined for us here at the Pitt Rivers. And I mean, the book sort of goes into the history of this, but in a really sort of, you know, for me as someone that works in the museum, a really shocking sort of moment really, where over social media, the Rose Must Fall Oxford movement, suddenly in the August of 2015, threw a light on a part of the museum, an aspect of its history, but also an aspect of what it means in the present that simply hadn't occurred to me in those ways at that time. Uh, and so the Rose Must Fall Oxford movement uh, sent a social media message that said the Pitt Rivers Museum is one of the most violent spaces in Oxford. So back in 2015, I mean, we were feeling as an institution fairly you know, good about ourselves. We had done, I mean, I, I'd been there sort of eight or nine years at that point. We had done a whole load of work with source communities. We had undertaken the restoration of human remains. We had hosted visits from source communities in North America and Australia and New Zealand. We'd held a a potlatch on the anthropology lawn. We had worked with objects of sacred importance for Haida people from, from, you know, from the Northwest coast, sort of near Vancouver and other you know, indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous communities around the world. You know, and we were trying as best we could as anthropologists to rehumanize what we recognized was a space that was you know, in the language of the time, contested, complex, full of so-called difficult histories, you know, and then suddenly from an African perspective, there's a wholly different reading that emerged. So for those, uh, I'm sure lots of those uh, listening will be aware of the Rose Must Fall movement, but it's worth just sort of looking at the timeline so the Rose Must Fall movement came about in early 2015 in the Cape Town context. And it was really a generational shift where after the end of apartheid in 1994, in 2015, students at UCT, at the university, were experiencing institutional racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet they had been born after the end of apartheid. So racism continued and how does structural racism, institutional racism, discrimination, world views that were sort of hangovers from the colonial past, how did that work? How did it persist? Well, in part, the argument was that right at the heart of the campus, there was this image of roads, Cecil Rhodes, the the imperialist and the mass murderer and the sort of a diamond miner and the founder of you know what turned into South Africa uh, and Zimbabwe, uh, Rhodesia as it was known, um, you know really really a you know one of the founding figures in a certain form of you know white supremacy that found its way over the years to 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 end up in the form of apartheid. Um, here was Rhodes, venerated at the heart of the, you know, of the academy. So the argument was that that art, that a sculpture, that something as apparently, you know, you know, ordinary as part of the built environment, had act, had had actively been put there, you know, in order to make those ideologies sort of naturalized, but also to make them endure, to make them last. So the removal of roads became an incredibly important part of the anti-racist anti movement because the erection of that statue originally, the symbolism that went with it, had been such an important part of how those values sort of had, had been had been sort of moved on to the museum, on to, on to the university in the first place. So in the so in the autumn of 2015, students involved in that movement arrived in Oxford, funded by the Rhodes uh, Trust from uh, Zimbabwe and from South Africa, and found an image of Rhodes here in Oxford. Obviously, the, the Rhodes building itself, 
but also the Cecil Rhodes image outside Oriel College. So that led to a wider campaign about the ongoing presence of the material culture of empire within the heart of the academy. The same arguments that had been put in the context of, of sort of Cape Town and Rhodes were then applied to the Codrington Library at All Souls College, named after a Caribbean slaver and since actually denamed. You know, the old Indian Institute with the elephant on the top and all the history that goes with that and the naming of Rhodes House itself. But really at the heart of that campaign in terms of the museum was not the violence of, the, of all the weapons that are on the top floor of the museum, but, but those objects that were taken with violence from Africa, at the heart of which was the Benin case, and the 145 or so objects that were part of what was looted in the military attack in terms of the, 80, of the, uh, the late 1890s. So that really, uh, you know, I've argued that one way we can see the colonial museum as sort of, sort of you know, coming into focus, as being seen at that time is something that we learn more generally from science and technology studies, that when something fails, that's often when we see it. So if you're on your way to work in the morning and the car won't start, you know, actually in that sort of moment, unlike any normal morning, the car is there, it's visible. And our job, of course, is to open up the bonnet and to take a look at what needs to be sort of fixed and what needs to be changed uh, as to whether certain things need to be removed or not, or does the whole thing need to be scrapped? That sort of conversation is what was, you know, happening, you know, among activists and protesters who were outside the pit rivers at that point. And, you know, I think it's incredibly important. I think, I mean, one thing I learned from being at the heart of, you know, on the, the, you know, receiving end, as it were, of that sort of sort of campaign is it is that when people are protesting outside your institution, it's incredibly important that, that you work to try to understand exactly what's going on and to understand how to see the world in the way that the that that, you know, that that is being said and to do your best to you know, you know put right what was being argued was an ongoing hurtfulness. The idea that these images, exactly the same as the image of Rhodes, had been installed in order to make a certain world few last. So it isn't just that as a curator, we would think about trying to work with source communities, that there were many who, who were walking into our museum who felt it as a, as a space of violence, who felt that the story of the looting of these objects, as it's uh, told on the panel in the middle, you can just about see the A4 sheet, sort of at the heart of that uh, display, that to tell that history of the dispossession of the Oba and this, this, this iconic attack, you know, upon an ancient African uh, kingdom, that itself was making that violence last every day that we opened our doors. So I think really in the second, third or so of this talk, I want to talk to you about sort of what that attack was and what the objects were, and to try and show you not just that, you know, there's a history of warfare here that as, as a wider society in the UK, we don't really know, and we certainly don't, don't you know, teach in our schools, but also that museums had a really important role to, to, to play as part of those histories. So the, uh, the Benin 1897 expedition was framed as a punishment and the, the, the punitive expedition was a framing that happened at a whole set of other interventions that were undertaken under the British and, and indeed also the Belgians, the French and the, and the sort of Germans. You know, at this time in Africa, uh, you know, it's a technique that we see emerging later, whether in, in Kenya or, or in Ireland. It's the logic of the reprisal. It's the logic of a sustained attack happening supposedly because it's been forced to happen because of responding to some earlier infraction or some earlier supposed sort of wrong thing. In this case, it was supposedly this enormous operation was launched because of the killing of two um, you know, white administrators. 
who were seeking to visit the Oba, the king of Benin, you know, in a, in a period of, of sort of holy retreat. Um, but the sheer scale, the tens of thousands uh, of, of, um, of sort of pounds that were put in, you know, the more than 5,000 individuals involved in this operation, the, the three million uh, bullets that were involved, the 36 uh, Maxim machine guns, the rocket launchers, the barbed wire and electric lighting, you know, all of this hyper modern uh, military technology that would find its way over the course of the next century onto the soils of Europe with such incredible loss was being experimented with upon African bodies at this time. And the Benin expedition, which of course was a naval expedition that attacked this ancient kingdom from th th three different sides, but uh, sort of, you as the book goes into, uh, removed whole towns and uh, villages, or, uh, you know, from, 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 from a vast area, so, uh, sort of all around. Uh, in terms of the numbers of people that were killed, they haven't been added up, but they're in five figures, you know, absolutely certainly. And so sort of really this is a history of not something that happened within empire. This isn't at this point a, a colony although it's a key moment in the foundation of uh, Nigeria as a colony. This is about the corporate activity of the Royal Niger Company, which was the kind of West African equivalent of uh, Cecil Rhodes sort of South African company, and also the protectorate, the Niger Coast protectorate. And the protectorate, you know, the idea that you're going to protect this area is this kind of informal empire. It's this indirect rule. It is the gentlemanly capitalism that is sometimes sort of talked about in the literature. All those you know, euphemisms really sort of miss the fact that it's in the protectorates at this time, these, the, these sort of border zones on the outskirts of empire, that we see these sort of levels of corporate and, and colonial sort of, sort of ultra violence. You're outside of the rule of law of, you know, that would normally happen in a colony and the corporate sort of soldiers are doing essentially you know, what they want. In this case, it's the Royal Navy. And, you know, actually the book argues that we ought to frame this as a military attack as, as a part of what I call uh, World War Zero, the 30 year war that was waged against Africa and African nations, African communities, uh, African uh, kingdoms from the Berlin Congress of 1884, through to the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. So 1897 is one part of this, and especially under the, uh, the coalition administration of 1895 to 1900, and especially around the, the, the Queen Victoria Jubilee year of 1897, the, the, this was really ratcheted up. And um, so many of the objects that were taken were taken in order to hand over to the Queen as part of those sort of jubilee uh, celebrations. Uh, of course, it was the sort of 60 year anniversary of her coming to the throne. So we need them to underline that what these punitive expeditions were doing was they were removing sort of local powers that were in the way, actually in this case, of the rubber trade and the palm oil trade. So this is about the rubber that goes on the bicycles uh, and increasingly of the, of the automobiles of the UK, but also the palm oil that was used to, uh, to grease the machinery uh, of the factories, but also you know, making things like sort of margarine. So, so this, this, this is uh, very much about extractive colonialism of that kind. And, you know, in this case, the Oba, the king of uh, Benin, was, was a part of a royal lineage that reached back unbroken, actually earlier than Elizabeth I. And the Benin uh, kingdom was, was absolutely one of these sort of West African uh, civilizations that emerged in, you know, what we would call the medieval periods, you know, in the, 
you know, in the 14th into the 15th century, these, these urban civilizations uh, that, that were also, as well as having sort of royal ritual and royal sort of landscapes, also had these incredible artistic uh, traditions and so sacred and so uh, sort of, sort of yeah, kept, you know, among the royal landscape itself were these artworks that they were entirely unknown actually outside of uh, Benin uh, city until this attack. So more than 10,000 objects were looted in the attack. Uh, we can talk about those in a moment, but the important thing is that these artworks were royal and sacred objects that were part of this wider sort of royal landscape. So you'll see the range of things, including more than 1,200 of the plaques. So these sort of you know, remarkable uh, relief plaques that sort of depict the Obers and their interactions over the generations with the Portuguese and other Europeans. Um, so they're maybe the most iconic of objects and we can all imagine them on display at the, uh, the BM in London, uh, you know, as we see on the left-hand side there. But as the case at the Pitt Rivers shows, there's much more involved than simply the brass plaques. There are also other brass objects that, that are made in the form of the, of the heads of the obers, as we see here in the middle, and of the figures of the horn blowers and the leopards and so many other forms of sort of figures made out of the bronze, but also so many other objects that are not made of, uh, uh, you know, actually of the bronze, such as the ivory work, the, the famous um, sort of hip ornament masks, an example of which we see in the left-hand corner, uh, that show the, the Queen Mother Idia uh, as she was uh, depicted in the 16th century. And so that's a 500 year old object that was originally in the Pitt Rivers collection that's, that's now in a German collection, but also the carved uh, sort of tusks. So, so again, with this very, really uh, unique iconography, the history and the achievements of each of the Obers is shown in the carving of, the, of these sort of tusks. Uh, uh, which were then sort of put, you know, on altars, actually into the heads of each of the obers, each of the, uh, the bronze obers. Here's an example in a very rare photograph from 1891 from a visitor that went to Benin City of uh, the, one of these altars. So you can see the bells at the, at the front and the figures at the back, each of which does not only sort of represent, but it, it actually uh, constitutes a royal ancestor. And then on either side, on the left and right, the heads of obers from the past, and then the carved ivory tusks that sort of tell the history of those obers. So you have to imagine a landscape in which over sort of 600 years or so, each of the palaces of the obers had been built, and then after their death had been allowed to fall into ruin over time, but to be continued as a site for the veneration of that Oba. So these sort of ruinous palaces were sacred sites. So when we see the photographs, because one of the very interesting thing about, about the Benin expedition was that it was about the taking of objects, but also about the taking of sort of photographs. There, there's a, it's a highly documented attack that shows a whole range of the photographic interventions here. A number of you may have seen the image on the right-hand side, the famous image of the laying out of the plaques sort of at the palace on the floor there. Less well-known is, is this image on the left, where the same man as we see on the right hand side there, there in, in, in his uh, pith helmet, is actually involved in the physical destruction, the burning down and the raising to the ground of Benin City. So when the Hague Convention came in, the first of the Hague Conventions in 1899, almost certainly a whole range of things that it introduced a ban on was a direct response to what was going on in the Benin sort of context in 1897. So the ban on the looting of artworks, the ban on the destruction of the villages and towns of innocent people, the ban on 
on the removal and the burning down of sacred or religious sites, all the way to the ban on the filing down of the bullets, which we know, and the, and the book sort of goes into the creation of the dum-dums, as they were called, where on the ship on the way from England, these things were being filed down. So when they went into the machine guns and they were fired, they would they would actually make, you know, the worst sort of sort of damage that they could into you know onto the body. So 1884 was the year of the foundation of the Pitt Rivers Museum. It was the year of the Berlin Congress. It was also the year of the invention of, of the Maxim. And really the machine gun is a big part of what makes the removal of these sort of kingdoms actually possible. They're able to move the machine guns up into the, into the jungle to, to, uh, to fire into the bush as they move along, to hack into the bush and to cut these swathes sort of into what, what earlier on it would have been actually a site that was really hard to attack. Um, you know, and I think that sort of relationship, that has an odd relationship if you think back to the diagram I showed you at the beginning and that ideology of the improvement of weaponry. You know, actually the... the the invention of the Maxim just was a leapfrog ahead in terms of what was possible. So those inequalities of the different sort of material histories of one sort of culture and another, of the technological difference, found its way in the Nigerian context into this incredibly violent history. So the campaign to sort of return what was uh, taken, the over 10,000 objects, that were taken is not something that just happened last year or the year before. And it's not something that has just happened in terms of a European conversation. It's been an African led movement, you know, actually since the 1930s, when the first objects were, were returned from the care of London, of the, uh, the BM, um, to Oberuk Enza with the second. Here is a photograph of the return of two of the coral crowns and a coral work robe that the, uh, uh, you know, that were returned to him at that point. And, you know, actually restitution and fallism, the, in terms of the movement to, to remove statues that we see in Algeria in the 1960s, we see elsewhere in Africa, I think in many ways these are, are really a parallel African-led movement, which recognise the significance of the taking of objects and their display in the metropolis, and also the the erection of these of these images to say, you know, that these are historic. You know, these are these are histories that should be remembered and should be uh, really uh, celebrated. These, in terms of African sort of movements, have been linked up in all sorts of ways over the years. Here in the UK, and responding again to Nigerian claims in the 1990s running up to the 100 year anniversary of the Benin attack that fell in, in the February of 80, in the, in the, uh, the February of um, uh, of um, 90, uh, 97 there was a I guess a, a visible sort of movement in terms of the work of uh, Bernie Grant and others, here he is outside the Museum of Mankind, as it then was, a part of the British Museum. And his, his work at that point and the movement that sought and failed to see the return of objects at that moment was, was understood by many to be a failure. But actually, I think as we approach the 125th anniversary of the attack in the February of next year, we see so many of the arguments that were put at that point really you know, coming of age. So in the final uh, 10 minutes or so, you know, I just want to sum up in terms of what is now sort of happening. I mean, I could go into, I mean, the, you know, the book invents a lot of words and it goes into some theory, some of which we need and some of which we don't. Certainly that notion, I'll, I'll give you a single example of some of the arguments that's put, which is the notion of the necrographic. So really in writing this book, I found so many of the vocabularies and the framings that I would naturally use as an anthropologist, as an archeologist, as an art historian, 
you know, actually entirely lacking. So maybe one of the natural sort of idioms or the most sort of common ways we talk about material culture in my field you know, would be in terms of the life history of the of an object, the, uh, the biographical account of how one thing moves from A to B. And, you know, it's almost like it gains an extra layer of context, an extra set of meanings as it's moved from, from one location to another or it moves across time. Here, in this case, it seemed to me completely inappropriate to talk about these objects meaning something new as, as having gained something, as if there's an extra layer that's been added to the meaning of the bronzes in the, at the moment in the care of the Pitt Rivers or other institutions like, like ours, because it's, a, it's actually a history of taking, it's a history of death, it's a history of loss. So I go into in the book of Sheila and Bembe's reuse or, or sort of reworking of the Foucauldian notion of the biopolitical, the politics of sort of life, which he sort of wrote about in the context of hospitals and, and of sort of prisons, where he talks about institutions through the notion of the politics of life. As Sheila Mbembe, the African scholar, writes about the necropolitics. He, he says in the context of a moment of history where we have not only sort of prisons and, and hospitals, but fortress Europe, where Africans are losing their lives every year in attempting to cross the Mediterranean, or indeed in our case in the UK, the English Channel every year. Actually, we need a politics of who gets to live and who gets to die, which he, call, he calls the necropolitical. So I, you know, you know, that's just sort of you know, one example in which in the book I try to reframe some of our concepts so we can try and understand that in the context of objects whose return is being demanded, we need to talk about histories of loss and death as well as only the, the sort of life history of these objects. But what does this mean for the for those of us that work in museums? How can we understand this and frame this and understand the restitution movement sort of better? Well, I think I would, you know, make that in order just to start to draw to a conclusion. I would make a link really with what I've learned through the work of my colleague uh, Nick Mizoff and others who've written about the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in the North American context, not as it emerged last year after the racist killing of uh, George F Floyd, but from 2014 after the killings, the murder, you know, the racist murders of Eric Garner and yeah, Michael Brown. So Nick, in his online book, you can get a copy online if, if you Google it, you can also buy a copy. So in what he calls the appearance of, of, uh, of Black Lives Matter, he makes a very simple, but I think in absolutely yeah, devastatingly relevant observation, which is also relevant for those of us in museums, where he says that the Black Lives Matter movement emerges out of a shift in visual technologies that suddenly the dash cam footage and cell phone footage that is made and can be shared shows, a, it sort of shines a light. It shows, you know, anti-black violence that's been happening for centuries. And suddenly that violence is seen and shared and out of that a politics emerges. We could add to that more recently, actually only a couple of months ago at the verdict at the moment of the verdicts uh, about the racist sort of murder of uh, George Floyd, the thing that was said by the Minnesota Attorney General, where he said, I would not call today's verdict justice because justice implies true restoration, but it is accountability. And accountability is the first step towards something we might see as sort of social justice. So for those in my position, in incredibly white organizations, in the incredibly white sort of discipline of anthropology and archeology, span where we have, it has been shown to us by protesters that a small number, not all, some of the displays in our museums, some of these objects were, were acquired and displayed as memorials to anti-black violence in order to celebrate that violence and to make it last. Here in our museums, where after the Second World War, when we beat the fascists, one of the first things that happened was next door in the Natural History Museum, we removed the skulls uh, 
that were lined up to tell the racist lie that there are different kinds of human being. But right next door in the cultural museum, in the Pitt Rivers Museum, we did not touch the displays that used art and culture to tell precisely the same story of supremacy at the height of empire. Anthropology in the 1890s, early 20th century has this relationship with the proto-fascism, you know, the white supremacy of, you know, that, that, that of course sort of went in other directions. So how do we undo those elements? How do we physically take apart those elements of what in the book I call the white infrastructure of our institutions so we can make them fit for the 21st century? Well, I argue that what some are calling the decolonization of museums and what I prefer to see as the unfinished work of anti-racism and anti-colonialism in our museums, that starts with the very ordinary and the boring work of transparency where the curator simply says, here's how far you are right this moment from a looted African object. And in the UK, you're never that far. You're never more than 150 miles away from a looted African object. In terms of the Benin objects, you know, there's my first attempt in terms of Leeds. We've got the City Museum and also the Royal Armouries, but you, you know, you can go to Hull, you can go to Manchester, you can, you can talk, we can talk about the Benin bronzes in Oxford and Cambridge and in Edinburgh and in uh, Dublin and in Belfast uh, and in Exeter and so forth. So making that list, showing the more than 160 institutions around the world, that's a first provisional attempt at that list. That listing process has some relationship with the act of saying someone's name, with the act of that sharing of the fact of sort of violence that we that we that we've seen with 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 those other sorts of contexts and i mean since the book has been published and absolutely not down to the book but down to the ongoing campaigning and ongoing diplomacy from nigerian colleagues uh the work has been you know the, as you'll have seen in the news there have been increasing commitments to return the benin bronzes from aberdeen for the National Museum in, in uh, Dublin, uh, from the Fowler Museum at, at uh, UCLA, from the Met, we saw just last week an announcement of, of the intention to return two museums from the Horniman in London, from every one of the federal museums across the 18 lender in the German context. So this is incredibly exciting. And for me, maybe a watershed was the Times um, sort of leader comment saying after in, in the wake of the announcement from Aberdeen that it was the right thing to do. And I think when we're at a point in our society where the Times has shifted its position, uh, I actually had a letter in the Times a year before that responding to an earlier leader position that said the Benin Bronzes should never be returned. To see that changing in a year has been incredible. So there's lots to talk about uh, over the q and I'm gonna wrap up, I think there, but really just to underline that for me, restitution is a normal part of my job. It has been in museums in the case, in a very different historical case of the return of sort of Nazi loot in the context of, holo of sort of Holocaust restitution, but also the return of human remains, uh, you know, to, you know, sort of internationally to indigenous groups, they have been normal parts of our working lives now for 30 years. What's happening now is an evolution of the professional practice over the return of cultural objects, which is a demand led process. It's a case by case approach. So those that wish to say this is, this is an attack upon museums that have in the past sought to say that on the one side there are Africans that want their objects back and on the other side there are the curators, who say that they should keep them, the main thing the book seeks really to do is to make an intervention that says, actually, that's not right. Many of us in the museum's world think that in the case of the Benin bronzes and on a case by case basis in other examples, when things were taken with violence, when things are asked for to be returned to their rightful owners, then really, yeah, time's up. So you can see there's a couple of links there to an online article I wrote about the notion of the, of, of the necrographic, 
There's a link there to the restitution of knowledge work I'm doing with, with those in sort of Berlin. And I was asked to leave this up as, as, a, as a note about your next event, uh, which I think is, is sort of next month. So I will, I will end there and hand over to, over to colleagues. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Don. That's a mass is packed in, in there. Great. Um, Eric, do you want to um, start off or shall I? Uh, yeah, well, um, <clears throat> uh, please uh, uh, write questions in the chat. We've got a few questions or comments, really more. Um, uh, uh, J Janet Douglas is just commenting, uh, and Dan did as well, that. Uh, um, that, 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 that there are objects in, in Leeds City Museum and uh, the Royal Armouries. But, uh, yes. uh, but, but uh, please write your questions in, uh, in the chat. Mm. Or, or, or um, actually, uh, Rachel, I think people could un unmute themselves and, and, and talk. Ask it themselves. Yes, okay. We don't want to just to, for it to get all. Uh... Chaotic. So oh, here's Anna from uh, Berlin who says, how yeah. does the return of object work as it probably takes a lot of work and time? So there's a very practical question. I think I'm sure lots of people are thinking that. OK, absolutely. Yeah, it's a really good question, a really important one. So, I mean, I think, I mean, we already know from the context of sort of Holocaust restitution, from the, from the case of the, of the return of human remains, that it that it isn't something that happens overnight that that these we are dealing with incredibly sensitive and hurtful and unfinished histories that it's a diplomatic process but it's one in which in the past we haven't been transparent enough about so so the role of the curator starts with being open and proactive in saying what is held and what there is and where it is um, in the case of the Benin uh, bronzes, obviously there are potentially sort of different claimants from the Nigerian side. But what's really exciting is the formation of, of the Legacy Restoration Trust, which has been able to bring together the Royal Court of uh, Benin, which of course continues to exist, with the, uh, the federal government uh, and also with the governor's office in Edo State, so that this can be a Nigerian led sort of process. You know, from my perspective, it isn't for Europeans or Americans to decide, you know, object by object, who is the rightful owner within Nigeria. That's something for the Nigerian you know, legal system, you know, to deal with, which which is more than, you know, you know which is it is more than sort of capable of, of uh, doing. Um, but the important thing is that we take ourselves as the European sort of descendant institutions and uh, descendant curators who were responsible for the taking of these objects, mm -hmm. that we remove ourselves from that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we have seen it in the context of sort of human remains and, and sort of Nazi loot, but absolutely crucially, you know, in the 90s, we heard so many arguments put in those cases that it was too complicated, that you were going to give it back to the wrong person, that if you gave it back, it might not be on display, it might not be seen by as many people. All the same arguments that we hear now in the case of the Benin bronzes. Well, mm -hmm. you know, actually, if you give something back... Uh, I think your dad has done that already. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I will do. I'm just um, sorting something out. No, 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 I'm not going to for sure. It's in my... Um, so that was faith, I think. Sorry about that. Okay, that's, a, that's all right. So, yeah, I mean, if you give something back, you know, in my view, you give it back on an unconditional and 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 also a permanent basis. So that, I mean, there are did the, these are ongoing conversations within the sector, but the museum's world is sort of using its expertise from other very different contexts of the settler colonial returns of human remains and of Holocaust to start to address these cases of sort of active looting. Yeah. Mm, good. Um, Joe Williams, I see you've put a question. Would you like to ask it in person? I'll give you a moment in case you'd like to unmute and pop up to ask it or, or I'll pose it for you if you, if you don't. So 
Joe has asked, what can museums best do to rehumanize the narratives of items themselves rather than the focus on how they were stolen? Sure, sure, absolutely. It's really important. So I think a big argument of the book is that this is not about rewriting the label. There are some, for example, those around the, the intended sort of 19th century galleries of the V&A, who would say that restoration is the wrong thing to do because it would somehow hide our history. What we need to do is, is to be really honest about these, these, these histories of empire, to tell them you know, again and again in the museum space. Whereas actually, I mean, what my book argues and, and actually gives examples of how the story of the looting and the, and the sacking you know, of the city is told and retold in every universal museum, world culture museum around the world, from St. Petersburg to sort of Paris to Berlin and, uh, and across the UK, even in sort of here in Oxford, we've got our own version of it. So no matter how much better you you seek to tell that story you're reinscribing the violence you're not you know you're not that isn't what these objects you know should mean but for as long as you retain them when they're being asked for to be returned that is what they mean and that's what i mean by the necrographic or, the, or indeed the necrological the sort of knowledge of loss and knowledge of death so so i would compare it to this sort of deep thick sort of layer of uh, sort of layer of, you know layer of ash that lies on top of these objects meanings at the moment that has been put there you know out of the taking so i don't think it's my role as a curator to lead on the work on the important and crucial work of the meaning and significance of these objects you know in terms of what they how, how they're able to tell us about sort of 16th and 17th century history in Benin, or indeed the contemporary cultural and the religious significance in the present. That's work that can happen actually when that work is being led from Nigeria. Um, and it isn't even necessarily about sending everything back. I mean, there are all sorts of you know, really interesting ways of handing over ownership, signing over ownership. So for now, the objects are are here and they sort of remain here but the decision about where they are you know is in nigerian hands um at the same time i think returns will open up gaps and in those gaps we can maybe recognize one role of the anthropology museum of the imperial museum as a sort of site of conscience a part of our role not our whole role because our important you know we've, we've sort of never needed something like an anthropology museum actually more than we do in this moment sort of today to celebrate and to and to recognize there's so many different ways of making and thinking and seeing and living from around the world you know actually outside of a eurocentric lens on on art and culture but that doesn't mean that we should that that, that these museums sort of earlier histories and their relationship to white supremacy and their relationship to violence sort of can't be undone. So for me, in these cases, examples like the Benin Bronzes, the role is to allow those histories to be untold, undone th through the restoration process, one part of which, you know, is the physical return. But of course, restoration, including, you know, the restoration of knowledge, the restoration of belief, the restoration of agency, and the removal of those in my very you know, privileged position to have access to all this knowledge to sort of undermine that privilege by sharing as much as we can and by seeking to let go yes um, josephine wellesley uh, uh, makes a very wesley sorry makes a very good point about you know modern methods of reproduction meaning that you can have identical models i wonder if even more vivid would be um maybe this has already been done having holographic representations to both represent continuing um uh, presence but also physical absence yes absolutely i mean i think we you know, again, we need, I mean, when the Sarsavoir report, which I haven't mentioned, of course, but 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 was so seminal, and my colleague uh, uh, Benedict Savoir is one of, is sort of working with me on on this 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 sort of wider project, the restoration of knowledge. So what the Sarsavoir report did, which really shocked all my French colleagues at the time, I remember in uh, um, November 2018 or 20, yeah, I guess it was November 2018 when it came out. You know, all over Facebook, all of the curators from the Musée du Cape on Lee and all the other colleagues were saying, 
you know, what on earth is this report doing in, in terms of introducing the notion of consent into this conversation? What is this language of sexual violence sort of doing in the context of objects in museums? But of course, consent absolutely is at the heart of this. And so, you know, what the Sar Savoir report opened up was the potential that we, that, we, that we highlight the objects that were taken with violence in these extreme circumstances, but there can be other forms of duress that can lead to other ways objects came, which, you know, which absolutely crucially are here against the will of people because you know, those objects are inalienable. They're not things that can be taken they, and they can't be sold and they shouldn't be seen. So when you're dealing with sacred objects that not only constitute, I'm sorry, that not only represent but actually constitute ancestors, we need to be incredibly careful about any idea we're going to make copies, we're going to do reproductions. Actually, it may well be that hand, handing back the intellectual ownership as well as the physical object is important. Handing back agency, um, yeah, I, th I think that's at the heart of these conversations. We need to be very wary you know, of those sort of nostalgic ideas that would say, well, you know, we can just make a copy and no one will notice. Well, that's not necessarily in our gift, I don't, I don't think. And, and so these, these are very much evolving ethical conversations. Mm. Um, Ivo um, said, uh, power never give, gives up its powers voluntarily. So where's this move to return artifacts come from? And is it just a token gesture? Well, from the way you talk, absolutely not. But uh, are some people seeing it as, oh, we'll just, we'll just give back a few things and then they'll quieten down about it? Sure. I mean, I think the tokenism thing is a really important conversation to have. So for many people you know, yeah, whether it's the toppling of Edward Colston or whether it's the, it's the return of the men in bronzes, somehow this is a distraction from the real work of anti-racism, anti-colonialism, facing up to sort of difficult histories, as people call it. Whereas actually, I think there is a, there's a recognition, though, I'm sure among, you know, you know, you know every, every, everyone here, there's a recognition that art and culture really matter. But that was something that was also shared with a very particular and very historically specific set of thinking that came out around sort of white supremacy in between the 1890s and the 1920s. So it's not by accident that the Confederate statues were being put up across the, the American South, that Rhodes was being erected and others sort of like him across African sort of colonies, and that Cecil Rhodes in Oxford and Edward Colston were, were sort of put up in that same time frame. There is a very specific 30 year period or so where art and culture, including museums, were co-opted and put to work for these ideologies. So, so the tokenism, you know, it certainly isn't tokenistic to try and dismantle that sort of that infrastructure. At the same time, there's a massive risk you know, I mean, I'm not a museum uh, director. I'm not the person that makes the decisions over restitution. You know, I'm I'm someone who is in a, a part of the privilege is that I have academic freedom, that, that I work in a museum, but I don't make the decision. So I can make, I can seek to amplify the voices of the Nigerians who are asking for this and to and to put the facts on the table, really. That's, that's I think, that argument over transparency is central. But yeah, I mean, I think many people would say that the French returns to Senegal and to Madagascar and to Benin that, that have ha happened so far, and then the French culture minister said, ah, well, that you know, none of this means that the other objects in the museums in France, you know, are in some way compromised. I thought, you know, I'm not sure that's right. So we need, to, and we absolutely need to make sure that restoration is not only about the Benin bronzes, you know, and that restoration is not only about the return of objects. It's about so many other ways in which we have to make anthropology and, archae and archaeology museums fit for the 21st century, which includes all sorts of things like, you know, ensuring that we start to look like the wider communities that we say that we serve and from whom we gain our, our wider legitimacy you know um so there's so much more work to do but i do think that restoration is an incredibly important sort of part of that you know of that work mm. 
And in the meantime, uh, Anna and her fellow students in Berlin are asking, uh, well, well, essentially, was the picture that you showed us of the case with the objects, is that how they are now? Or is there some, has there been some change to the way they're displayed at the moment? So there's been no change. And that, you know, that is, that, that is, in, that is incredibly uh, yeah, problematic in my view. We did make a change, as you may have seen in the, in the news, uh, when we reopened in September after a long period of being shut because of lockdown, we removed all human remains, well, all what we call the unmodified human remains. So there are still objects that have got some parts of people's bodies, a sort of composite objects that include hair or, or bone or whatever, but the skulls, sh shrunken heads famously, all those things, so all of those were removed from sort of display. You know, I very much advocated and have asked the question internally, I mean, what on earth are we doing with this sort of fake, you know, invented sort of, sort of, sort of altar, which, which was built in, you know, in the early 1990s in order to show these objects, you know, what, how on earth is that acceptable? But yeah, I mean, these things don't change fast. I mean, the book only came out in uh, November. Um, I also, I mean, just on that point or on a, on an allied point, I just wanted to make sure that we address a point that was made in the questions, which was over sort of sort of there was something about the uh, the proceeds of the book. And is this going to be sort of donated? Well, I mean, the first thing is, I'm afraid the book isn't really going to make any money. But what I did do was I, you, you, know, you know, was that we bought 500 uh, copies of the book to and they have been distributed across uh, Nigeria, but also to universities elsewhere in Africa. So the knowledge is sort of physically there, you know, in a whole host of sort of, sort of, sort of you know, publicly accessible uh, locations, uh, in the city libraries, in the university libraries, in a whole whole number of different sort of locations. So I mean that that was that was something that you know that I hope is positive, that has been at the heart of seeking to make you know this information available out there. Where we're also going to, as a lot of other museums are doing, we're also now, you know, the book's part of a catalyzing of the sharing of information from other museums. So that transparency, you know, is a part of it. And you mentioned about work with uh, source communities. So uh, what about your, you know, visits and um, connections with the, the people um, who are the descendants of those who had the stuff stolen back in the 1890s? Sure, yeah. So, so I mean, via the Benin a dialogue a group, uh, a whole host of institutions in sort of Europe have been in dialogue with uh, Nigerian colleagues uh, and the key s stakeholders for sort of 10 years or so. You know, to some degree, the book was written in frustration with the idea that dialogue can just be a talking shop. And there are all sorts of risks there. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a person by person and very human thing. So I'm doing various things with uh, Victor Ehik Hamanor, who's one of the leading uh, uh, Nigerian artists who's from uh, Benin and has been very much an advocate of the returns, um, yeah, I mean, we're doing our best, or I personally am doing my best to uh, sort of highlight uh, uh, the, yeah, those voices, but, 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 but also centrally to, uh, to support what's now really a broad coalition around the founding of the Edo Museum of uh, West African Art, which, uh, you know, you know, with the architects had said, said David Ajay is hope, hoped to be opening its doors in 2025. You know, and the potential that this often, you know, that this this offers a really important uh, sort of model that other African nations, other other African sort of non-national actors will be able to draw from. I mean, we I think we have to remember that African restitution involves a whole host of other contexts, whole host of other sort of histories. But for all sorts of reasons, the Benin bronzes have this iconic status. So using them as a, you know, as a, as a point of entry, 
you know, into this conversation. So it's sort of more widely on the conversation. We are seeing, I mean, you know, we've seen now the Belgian government make a commitment to return the objects taken from the Belgian colonies. We've seen the Germans leading this sort of necessary facing up to British colonial history. We've seen Scotland sort of returning things. We saw a statement only today the publication uh, by the Scottish uh, government of the, their approach to issues over restitution, the rubric they're going to follow. We've seen the Benin bronzes sort of returned or intended to be returned from sort of Dublin. So actually London is looking very, very isolated. For the regions in the UK, you know, this is really important because we imagine the Benin Bronzes are all in the British Museum. We imagine there are legal restrictions to all these returns. But in fact, here in the UK, you know, actually less than half of the Benin objects that were taken are in, you know, are in the BM. So many more of them are, are in the regional museums, are in the, are in the regional museums. And you know, the Pitt Rivers in Leeds and elsewhere, we're not subject to the National Heritage Act. So the decision in terms of the return of anything in Leeds will be a matter for city councillors, you know, if it's, if it's a local authority museum. And the decision of what gets returned from the University of East Anglia or the University of Cambridge will be a decision for the trustees of the university. So this is a conversation that I think is gonna land and is gonna develop in a different way in different parts of the UK. And I think that's what's so exciting for me is to see the conversation actually you know, taking on a different sort of character in terms of, for example, the city of Leeds. I, I, I think it will be amazing to see, you know, how this conversation over museums and empire will work out in, in that context as compared to Exeter or to Bristol or to Edinburgh. Uh, ironically, I mean, Pitt Rivers himself might have been quite intrigued by the evolution of the conversation. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I mean, that was very good. Uh, thank you for answering also another question about who would actually make the decisions. It's very interesting that it would be devolved to those levels. Um, uh, Janet um, is asking about um, the key factor about restitution. Is it related particularly or specifically to the objects that have been acquired violently? And what do you do about the, the traded and gifted items, you know, maybe freely given or, or maybe under duress or trickery or whatever? It's sure. a different category, though. Sure, that's it. So I think it's a yeah, demand-led process. It isn't a supply side. I mean, I'm the supply side, right? I work in a museum. Yeah, I can share the knowledge. Yeah, you know, I can seek to encourage my colleagues, you know, to say yes when a return is, you know, is being asked for. But you know, it's not about sending back. It's about giving back. It's not about emptying out the museums or attacking the museums or sort of shutting them down. It's it's about actually removing the cancer or the poison that's, 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 that's at the heart of some of these sort of displays. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that hopefully answers the question in terms of um, uh, yeah, ensuring that we simply you know, adopt a case by case basis, we open up the information so, uh, and, so, and so people can make the claims, um, and then, yeah, I mean, we assess each sort of claim on its own basis. Mm. Um, and there have been examples, certainly with the case of, of the return of ancestral human remains, where there's been no sense in which this has been a military attack. This, this has just been a you know, grave that's been dug up. You know, it's been, you know, a person that's been, you know, that's been killed and, some, and their, their sort of mortal remains, you know, removed. Um, so I think if we look at the American conversation now that's happening at Harvard and sort of Penn University, you know, about human remains in their care, the fact that there are tens of thousands of individuals represented that are hidden away in the stores. Here in the UK, so much of the cultural remains conversation is about, it is about what's hidden away in the stores. So less than 1% of what was uh, taken from Africa under, under empire, that's in our museums is on display. I'd say almost certainly less than 0.1%. So we are talking about cases of archeological and anthropological objects 
that haven't been opened in, in some cases for 100 years. This is about the, the idea that, as we learned from the American com sort of conversations, that we can't any longer just hide these things away, you know, and not have them on the database and not care for them. So many of them are in orphaned collections where, where there isn't even a world cultures collection, you know, where we've seen the museum sector subject to over 10 years of continual cuts under austerity. You know, so, so there are real problems in terms of because it takes curatorial work to understand what you've got, you know, never mind to give it back. So this is a case, I think, where we have, though, to say we can't any longer let these objects and these people sort of languish in the museum stores. We have to have a wider cultural reckoning with what our museums were and what, what they are in the present, but also so we can remake them as the crucial public spaces that we need so much. Anthropology museums are so important, you know, in terms of how we go forward, in terms of, uh, of actually how we use our art and culture for making society better. You know, I think that's a very good point on, on which to um, wrap up, actually. Um, and I think it's amazing to think of those photographs that were taken in 1897, and then that this whole movement that perhaps once a starting point was 2015, but then last year uh, ramped up so significantly as a result of images being captured and shared. And now here tonight, because of new technology and because of what's happened with this great interruption, we've, I hope, we've managed to capture this um, and the, uh, your presentation and your answers to the questions are now part of you know the record that we have here in Leeds that will make available more widely and add to that conversation um, that will you know it's got so many strands as we can now appreciate so much more so thank you thank you so much Eric I'll just uh, hand over to you. Oh, th th thank you very much uh, Rachel um, can I just uh, Thank Dan uh, uh, most sincerely for a uh, extremely thought-provoking talk um, covering areas that I, uh, I, I certainly personally I, I had, had hardly touched on. So uh, th thank you for all of that. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who, uh, uh, who who attended, particularly those who uh, sent in questions. Um, terrific questions, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, well done to, to Dan again for answering them so so well and so thoroughly. So um, thank you for attending the uh, Leeds Phil and Lit talk. Uh, there is another one coming up, which you saw at the at the end. Now, there it is again. Um, uh, next month, uh, towards the end of July. Uh, uh, hope we'll see you all again there. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night, everybody. And.